Our next speaker is Dr. Brad Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox is director of the National Marriage Project at the University of, of Virginia. He is associate professor of sociology at the University of Virginia and a member of the James Madison Society at Princeton University. Dr. Wilcox's research focuses on marriage and cohabitation and on the ways that gender, religion, and children influence the quality and stability of American family life. He's published articles on marriage, cohabitation, parenting, and fatherhood in the American Sociological Review, Social Forces, the Journal of Marriage and Family, and the Journal of the Scientific Study of Religion. His first book, Soft Patriarchs, New Men, How Christianity Shapes Fathers and Husbands, examines the ways in which religious beliefs and practices of American Protestant men influence their approach to parenting, household labor, and marriage. He came to my personal attention through his 2010 report, When Marriage Disappears, The New Middle America, which exposes the retreat from America, for the, sorry, the retreat from marriage, more probably spoken, which is happening in middle class America. But this afternoon, Dr. Wilcox will enlighten us regarding the role that gender plays in parenting. So I invite you to come forward. Thanks, Derek, for that kind introduction. I find myself in a curious position. Uh, I travel the world from Montevideo to Marrakesh, from Warsaw to Washington, from Bogota to Ottawa, to offer a social scientific perspective on the family. I rely upon large-scale surveys, statistical models, and peer-reviewed studies to convey important truths about marriage and family life. But virtually everything I have to say is what would have been considered common sense by my grandma. <laughs> that is, I'm in the business of using elaborate social science to prove grandma right. So, okay. Alas, every day we seem to be less and less inclined to listen to the wisdom of grandma. Take California last August. At the beginning of that month, San Francisco Judge Von Walker struck down California's marriage law and declared in his legal opinion that it's beyond any doubt the parents' genders are irrelevant to children's developmental outcomes. I think grandma would beg to differ. The silliness from California continued later in the month when Hollywood star Jennifer Aniston, who was then starring in a movie about a woman who uses a sperm donor to have a baby, said the following. She said, quote, women are realizing that they don't have to settle with a man just to have that child, unquote. I don't think grandma would agree that having a sperm donor for a daddy is a good idea. More generally though, these two quotes are indicative of a new elite wisdom that is taking hold in much of the Americas, including Canada. The new elite wisdom is that all kinds of families are just as good as the intact married family for children, and that mothers and fathers do not make distinctive contributions to the emotional, the social, and the financial welfare of their kids. Now regardless of this elite wisdom, a large and growing body of social science indicates that mothers and fathers bring distinctive talents to the parenting enterprise. That children are most likely to thrive and even survive when they're raised by their own mother and father. That kids long to know and be known by the man and woman who brought them into this world. In other words, it's not just gender differences that matter to kids, it's being in relationship to their own biological father and mother. So in light of these basic ideas, let me now take you on a kind of tour de force of the science regarding gender and parenthood. We're going to start with moms. Of course, among the many distinctive talents that moms bring to the parenting enterprise, four stand out. Breastfeeding, understanding their children, communicating with their children, and nurturing their children. Now, obviously, only mothers can breastfeed their kids. At least maybe we'll see something different in a, a few years. But at least right now, only moms <laughs> can breastfeed their kids. And of course, breastfeeding is time consuming and our contemporary world often inconvenient. But most mothers, once they kind of um, make sense of it, get a sort of, you know, get it down, find breastfeeding both physically pleasurable 
um, and emotionally rewarding. There are also clear health benefits for mothers who breastfeed. There is a market reduction in the risk of breast cancer. As importantly, the medical literature on the advantages of breastfeeding could not be clearer. Breast milk offers infants a range of sugars, nutrients, and antibodies that are unavailable in infant formula. Breastfeeding protects infants against at least 15 serious maladies, from ear infections to sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. Most importantly, I think, breastfeeding helps to cement the biological foundations of a unique mother-child bond that lasts into and beyond adolescence. So clearly, mothers have a very sex-specific advantage in parenting when it comes to breastfeeding. When it comes to parenting, mothers build on this biological foundation to excel in interpreting the physical cues of their children. Mothers are more responsive to distinctive cries of infants. They're better able than dads, for instance, to distinguish between a cry of hunger and a cry of pain from their baby. They're also better than dads at detecting the emotions of their children by looking at their faces, postures, and gestures. One experiment found, for instance, that women are better than men at identifying infant emotions such as sadness, fear, surprise, or joy. Another study found that teenagers report that mothers know them better and are more in tune with their moods compared to dads. Dr. Marion Legato, who directs the Partnership for Gender and Specific Medicine at Columbia University, believes biology has primed women to read nonverbal cues of infants. She writes, quote, women have to be better at reading the subtle and nuanced language of human expression compared to men so they can better determine the needs of their highly dependent, wordless infants." Unquote. And as kids age into adolescence, moms typically retain this advantage. So in sum, compared to fathers, mothers are better able to read their children's actions and appearances to determine their emotional and physical state. Moms also have an advantage when it comes to communicating with their kids. They use more words and more descriptive words with their children. They can interpret the tone and content of their children's utterances better than men. And they remember what their kids actually say better than fathers do. And I can certainly attest all these things personally. <laughs> For instance, moms are better at detecting whether an ambiguous comment, you and dad sure seem concerned about my grades, is meant to be ironic, critical, or complimentary. Now, what is it? And there, I think there are social reasons, but I think there are also biological reasons here. And I'll just mention three. Number one, women have more nerves in the left brain, which is the seat of our ability to process language compared to men. Women's left and right brains also enjoy more connectivity than do men's. That is, the corpus callosum, the network of fibers connecting the left and the right brains, is larger in women's brains than it is in men's brains. Women also have more dopamine in the part of the brain responsible for language and memory skills. Dopamine is a chemical messenger that helps deliver information efficiently within the brain. Once again, as Dr. Legato from Columbia says, she says, quote, the increased accessibility of these biological systems make listening to, understanding, and producing speech easier for women, unquote. And once again, as someone who lives with one woman and four girls, I can attest to the truth of Dr. Legato's insight about women's advantage in this department. So this maternal sensitivity to children helps explain why mothers are superior when it comes to nurturing the young, especially infants and toddlers. Because they excel in reading their children, they're better able to provide their kids with what they need, from a snack to a hug, when they're in some type of distress. Perhaps more importantly, there is considerable sociological and psychological evidence that mothers are more emotionally attached to their kids than are fathers. So the point is that mothers seem to be more invested in responding to their children's immediate needs, and fathers are more likely to give their kids a measure of latitude. Well, why is this? Well, it's in part because of the biological evidence that moms are primed by their hormones to engage in nurturing behavior, like hugging, praising, or cuddling. We know, for instance, that women have markedly higher levels of estrogen compared to men, and estrogen is known to promote nurturing behavior in humans. The hormone oxytocin, which is released at high levels in women during pregnancy and breastfeeding, makes mothers more interested in bonding with children and engaging in nurturing behavior compared to dads. 
In other words, not only are women better at nurturing, but they also seem to draw more satisfaction from expending time and energy on nurturing kids, once again, particularly younger children. And kids know this, they intuit this. Numerous studies indicate that infants and toddlers prefer their moms compared to their dads when they're seeking solace or relief from hunger, fear, sickness, or some other distress. Mothers tend to be more soothing. For instance, one study done at Boston Children's Hospital found that infants relaxed when moms approached. Their pulse, their breathing rates, their eyelids all lowered when mom came into the picture. So in other words, when children look for comfort and consolation, no one compares to mom. So for all these reasons, it should come as no surprise to find that as Stanford psychology professor Eleanor Maccabee has observed, quote, in all known societies, women, whether they're working outside the home or not, assume most of the day-to-day -day responsibility for childcare. Or as Rutgers anthropologist Helen Fisher has said, in every culture in the world where anthropologists have looked, in 168 societies, even where women are exceedingly economically powerful, women do the vast majority of the raising of the very small children. Women are interested in babies. They bear the babies. They've got high levels of estrogen associated with the nurturing of the very young, unquote. And of course, this point echoes the point we heard about even Sweden, where women dominate the paid provision of childcare. So taken together, mothers' comparative advantage in breastfeeding, understanding their kids, communicating with their children, and nurturing makes it logical for societies to organize the bulk of child rearing around the mother. And this is indeed what we see in countries ranging from Spain to South Africa, from India to England, and from Colombia to Canada. Although the distinctive talents that mothers bring to the child rearing enterprise are invaluable, especially for infants and toddlers, Fathers also bring an array of distinctive talents to the parenting enterprise. I'm going to focus here on five advantages that dads bring to family life when it comes to providing, discipline, play, challenging their kids to embrace life's challenges and opportunities, and then finally, loving the mother of their children. Now the first point that I want to make here is that money actually matters, and that we talk about parenting um, in the academy and in the media, often we, I think, forget this basic reality, this basic truth, that money matters for families when it comes to things like food, clothing, housing, and education. And that at least in intact married families, it's still the case that dads are more likely to focus more on this providership dimension than are women. They work more hours typically after kids come along, whereas wives tend to work fewer hours after kids come along. And that in the US at least, it's still the case that about two thirds of household income in married families um, is brought in by the father. So clearly here, fathers make a real material contribution to the welfare of their family, one that we should not forget and that we should not minimize. The second point is that although mothers actually discipline their kids more often, words, they have more instances of discipline with their kids um, because they spend more time with their kids, dads do have a comparative advantage in this area. Typically dads engender more fear than mothers in their children because of their comparative physical strength and size along with the pitch and inflection of the voice of the father. All these things can telegraph toughness to kids. So compared to moms, dads are more assertive in their dealings with their children, and they're less likely to bend family rules or principles for their kids. In a word, dads tend to be firmer and more compelling disciplinarians than mothers. This may be linked in part to, for instance, differences in testosterone. You know, insofar as testosterone is associated with things like strength, voice, you know, dominance, and whatnot. But for whatever reason, whether it's biological or social or some combination thereof, fathers are more likely than mothers to get their kids, particularly their teenage sons, to respond appropriately to their disciplinary strategy, both because of their uniquely firm approach to discipline and because boys seem more likely to respond to discipline from someone of the same sex. For all these reasons then, dad's discipline plays a signal role in fostering an orderly climate in the home. 
Dads also have an advantage when it comes to play. Although mothers, once again, spend more time playing quickly with their younger kids, their small kids, than do dads, the type of play that dads engage in with their kids is distinctive. Fathers are much more likely to engage their infants, their toddlers, and their teens in vigorous, physical, and exciting forms of play and games. Dads are more likely than moms to be found throwing their toddlers up into the air in the local park or kicking a soccer ball with their teenage son. And this vigorous style of play is also actually popular among infants. I mentioned that Boston Children's study before. Well, what they found in that study when dads approached the baby was the infants breathed more quickly, they tensed their shoulders, and their eyes widened as if they knew something exciting was about to happen. Now, all this is important because this kind of play promotes social skills, intellectual development, and a sense of self-control. We actually, we're finding more and more about how, how important play is for, for kids' development in so many different ways. So the playful side to dads teaches their children how to regulate their feelings and behaviors as they interact with others. We know, for instance, that engaging in rough physical play, rough housing with dad, uh, you know, in the family room, say, at, you know, at 7.30 at night when mom is trying to get the kids to bed. This is important because it teaches kids how to deal with aggressive impulses and physical contact without losing control of their emotions. One study found that father-child rough play taught kids how to recognize others' emotions and to regulate their own emotions. Or as Emory psychologist John Snary wrote, quote, children who rough house with their fathers usually quickly learn that biting, kicking, and other forms of physical violence are not acceptable, unquote. So kids who play more often with their dads are even more popular in school, and more generally, they are better prepared for the game of life. Dads also play a central role in pushing their kids to face the challenges and opportunities that confront them outside the home. Compared to mothers, fathers are more likely to encourage their children to take up difficult tasks, to seek out novel experiences, and to endure pain and hardship without yielding. At a young age, fathers are more likely than mothers to encourage toddlers to engage in novel activities, to engage strangers, and to be independent. As children enter into adolescence, dads are more likely to introduce their kids to the worlds of work, sports, and civil society. The bottom line here is that dads seem to excel in teaching their kids the virtues of fortitude, temperance, and prudence as they prepare for life outside the family. Or in the words of Canadian psychologist Daniel Paquette, quote, fathers seem to play an essential role in the empowerment of children and the opening of children to the outside world, unquote. And not surprisingly, there's considerable evidence that paternal involvement is linked to high rates of educational and occupational attainment, self-confidence, and more pro-social behavior for boys and for girls. Now, I've talked directly about how moms and dads impact uh, their kids. I want to say something quickly about how dads indirectly impact their kids, and that is in the way in which they love the mother of their children. And we know that one of the best predictors of good mothering is having a supportive and loving husband. Because women who have a good marriage are more involved with their kids, they're more nurturing of their children, and they're better at monitoring their kids. So clearly there's a way in which the love between father and mother spills over into the maternal child relationship in ways that are beneficial to children. It's also, I think, important too that the relationship between mom and dad sets a kind of template for boys and for girls um, that will frame the way in which they approach um, you know, dating and courtship later on in life. So the boys, for instance, who, who see a father who loves and respects their mother are more likely to treat girls and women in a respectful and affectionate spirit. And likewise, girls who grow up in a good home are more likely to be expecting to be treated with respect um, and affection when they are dating or courting a boy or a man as they get older. So in all these ways, this relationship is important um, it's important that dad is, is doing it well. Now, in terms of the kind of outcomes that we can talk about with regards to sort of gender and parenthood, the research on these kinds of questions indicates that sex-differentiated parenting has some benefits for kids. So one review of the research in child development found that kids who experience sex-typical behavior from mom and dad 
where mom was more responsive and nurturing and dad was more challenging and firm were more competent than kids whose parents did not engage in sex typical behavior. Another study of adolescents found that the best parenting approach was one in which moms were highly responsive and dads were highly demanding of their kids. The research on family structure is also, I think, very suggestive. In general, kids who grow up outside an intact married family are two to three times more likely to have serious psychological, academic, or social problems compared to kids who have just a single parent. And the general tenor, I think, of this research can be illustrated by briefly considering what we know about fatherlessness um, for boys and for girls. And I should say, as a sort of as a parenthetical note here, that I was raised by a single mother, um, and maybe single mothers here today, and I want to tell you that they can do a great job of raising children. I think that my, my sister and I turned out pretty well. But I'm also a sociologist, and speaking kind of from a broader perspective, I want to just underline the fact that on average, generally speaking, the best place for a child is in an intact, married, biological households. Just making the distinction between recognizing there are going to be some you know, single parents, some adoptive parents, we're also adoptive parents, my wife and I, um, can do a great job, but that, that's not the ideal. The ideal is for kids to have their intact, biological, married parents um, in the picture uh, for them. So for boys, the link between crime and fatherlessness is very clear. As the former U.S. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan observed, and controversially so, but I think accurately, quote, a community that allows a large number of young men to grow up in broken families, dominated by women, never acquiring any stable relationship to male authority, that community asks for and gets chaos, unquote. So boys learn self-control, as we've heard, from playing with and being disciplined by a loving father. They learn to control their own aggressive instincts when they see a man that they respect and love their father, handling frustration, conflict, and difficulty without resorting to violence. By contrast, boys who do not regularly experience the love, discipline, and the modeling of a good father are more likely to engage in what we call compensatory masculinity, where they reject and denigrate all that's feminine and instead seek to prove their masculinity by engaging in domineering, violent, and promiscuous behavior. So studies of crime give us some sense of what's happening here. So my colleague and my mentor actually at Princeton, Sarah McClanahan, did this particular study and she found that boys who are raised in single parent homes were about twice as likely to end up spending some time in prison or in jail before they turned age 32. Um, in the U.S. This is controlling for a host of factors like education, income, and race. And studies of crime and family patterns that look at the neighborhood or the society or community level come to similar conclusions. So as Harvard sociologist Robert Sampson said, quote, family structure is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, predictor of variations of urban violence across cities in the United States. But dads also matter for girls. They play an important role in, among other things, structuring the romantic and sexual lives of their daughters. Dads who are affectionate and firm with their daughters, who love and respect their wives, and who simply stick around, can play a crucial role in minimizing the likelihood that their daughters will be sexually active prior to marriage or are sexually active at a young age. The affection that dads bestow on their daughters makes these daughters less likely to seek attention from young men, and to get involved sexually with members of the opposite sex. Fathers also protect their daughters from premarital sexual activity by setting clear disciplinary limits for their daughters, monitoring their whereabouts, and by signaling to young men that sexual activity will not be tolerated. Finally, I think this is the most fascinating thing. Um, when they're in the home, Research by University of Arizona psychology professor Bruce Ellis suggests that dads actually send a biological signal through their pheromones. And of course, these are special aromatic chemical compounds that are released by men and women. Um, their pheromones seem to slow the sexual development of their daughters. This in turn makes daughters less interested in sexual activity and less likely to be seen as sexual objects. So it's fascinating. What his work suggests, just as a parenthetical note, is that girls who grow up with their intact um, bio father in a household have the latest ages of puberty um, and the girls who grow up in a single mother household have the sort of the mid, mid range when it comes to puberty and the girls who are raised by stepfathers or who are raised when there's a boyfriend in the home have the earliest ages at puberty 
And the thinking here is that being exposed to an unrelated male seems to accelerate the sexual development of the adolescent female. That's the basic theory here that's operating. But the point is that dads matter not just socially, but they also matter, it seems to be, biologically. Actually, sorry, we'll just go back one second here. And you can see, um, yep. So you can see here just concretely that about 5% of kids whose dads are there for their entire childhood, girls, become pregnant as teens in the US. Whereas if dad leaves between the ages of six and 18, it doubles the risk. And if dad leaves before um, the girl turns six, it increases the risk by seven times. So there's a very strong association between dad being in the home um, and a girl having a much lower risk of having a teenage pregnancy. We also have, and you may have heard Elizabeth Marcourt from the Institute for American Values speak directly to this particular uh, new, new report. My daddy's name is Donor. But I mentioned earlier um, in my presentation that Jennifer Aniston claimed that basically women can raise kids on their own with really no problem. And she, of course, was playing a woman who had a child through a sperm donor. But this new study from the Institute for American Values suggests that you know, she's simply wrong. Um, and that kids who were raised by single mothers through donor insemination, often, by the way, who were well-educated and relatively affluent, are more than twice as likely as young adults to report that they'd had trouble with uh, police or law enforcement, um, or that they were struggling with abuse of alcohol or drugs. So it's not the case that you can kind of have a child on your own in this manner and not expect it's going to have some impact on the child that you bring into this, uh, into this world. So our tour de force this afternoon of the social science literature on gender and parenting indicates the following. The best psychological, sociological, I think even biological research to date suggests that on average, men and women bring different talents to the parenting enterprise. The kids benefit from having parents with distinct parenting styles, that we ought to organize our families to take advantage of these distinct styles, and that family breakdown poses a serious threat to kids and to the societies within which they live. What do we do with this science? Well, I think one thing we need to do is recognize that there will be some differences in how moms and dads approach parenting. Eleanor McAbee, the distinguished feminist psychologist at Stanford University, who once championed the idea that sex differences were caused only by socialization, now acknowledges the importance of biology in explaining sex differences in parenting. In her latest book, The Two Sexes, she concludes her study of men and women by admitting that, quote, it's probably not realistic to set a 50-50 division of labor between fathers and mothers in the day-to-day -day care of children as the most desirable pattern toward which we should strive as a social goal. We should consider the alternative view that equity between the sexes does not have to mean exact equality in the sense of the two sexes having exactly the same lifestyles and exactly the same allocation of time, unquote. The second thing that we need to do is to cast aside the California dreams of San Francisco and Hollywood elites and renew our appreciation for grandma's wisdom about marriage, motherhood, fatherhood, and children. Specifically, we should do more to strengthen marriage, recognizing that marriage is an institution that virtually all societies and all major civilizations have devised to ensure that kids have the benefit of being reared by their mother and their father. And let me be clear here, this is not a religious claim. This is a human claim. Marriage can be found in every major civilization in the world, precisely because every civilization in the world, historically, has recognized at some level that children are more likely to thrive when they have the emotional, the social, and the financial support of both their parents. So to conclude, let all of us in our own spheres, from politics to business to education to the home, do all that we can to ensure that our children have the good fortune of growing up with the man and the woman whose love brought them into this world, that is, with their own married mother and father. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, there's now time for question and answer, so if you have a question, uh, I invite you to make your way to the uh, microphone. I, I, I do have to say personally, I'm a new dad. I'm only I'm okay. a three and a half month old, so yeah. this is uh, encouraging and challenging. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, I might encourage, well, if I say I'll encourage my wife to watch this 
<laughs> I cast no aspersions on the level. Okay. <laughs> Great, Derek. Um, I think one of the challenges, we had a bill before Canadian, the Canadian Parliament recently to enshrine gender expression and gender identity in Canadian law. And uh, quite difficult to speak against that, in, uh, very complicated to speak against that. And I think it's often dominated by the stories of those who feel discriminated against versus the data. Right. Um, how would you encourage us to, um, to continue to um, discuss this, especially with those who would consider um, gender irrelevant? Well, I think one thing that's important to do is to recognize that there are going to be men and women who don't kind of conform to these average patterns. And um, I think sometimes their experience becomes you know, really magnified in public discourse. The people who kind of are on you know, some end of the, of the curve, if you will, the, you know, the bell curve. Um, so to recognize that there is going to be diversity, that not all women experience motherhood in the same way, that, not, that all, not all men experience fatherhood in the same way, and so that we have to be, you know, cognizant of that reality and have some kind of way of accommodating it. But at the same time, to sort of recognize that, you know, well, on average, these are some sort of patterns that are pretty clear, not only for human beings, but for, for primates, for heaven's sakes. And if, you know, people want to be kind of if they want to kind of bury their head in the sand and practice a kind of, of feminist fundamentalism, well, they can do that. But that's not, that's anti-science. I think you have to sort of, real, we have to sort of make the point that the science here is on our side, you know, and that we can look both at this species and other species to see some of these fundamental patterns at work. And that those who disagree with us on this, you know, really need to sort of get with the science, would be my, I mean, that's, that's a sort of strong way of putting it, but I think it's, 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 it's true, too. So. Well, you pretty well asked the question, so I'll rephrase it a bit to get from a different slant a bit. Certainly, you speak of the aspects of basically uh, the abilities of women in terms of, of, shall we say, the tender years. Right. And that's often right. used again in courts and other institutions sure. saying, well, therefore, that's the best parent. Of course, you can't, but then you also show that, you know, a lots of other uh, benefits of the, both parents come into play, right. maybe a little bit later, but of course, courts are like forever, right? How do you how do you approach the argument? Say, you know, other than saying, well, you know, if you think the kid will be better off with two parents by the time they're four, you kind of want to start the process now, right? You can't say, well, you know, single parent for three years and then we'll let the other one come back in. I mean, how do you deal with that? Uh, basically, I said that ten years doctrine is kind of a vestige of earlier times, and it's still here. You're saying, how do I deal with the ten years doctrine? Well, the, well, the idea that you know. Mothers, because they can breastfeed, are the better parent. Therefore, you know, simplify the thing, have the child there, and then we'll work out the rest of it later. But that's, I think, from what you've shown, is is some of a, of a specious argument. So, any ideas as to how you deal with that oversimplification of the process? Well, I think you know the the key here is to sort of try to get people to understand that even though moms may have an advantage when it comes to those years when kids are infants and toddlers. I think particularly as kids get older and older, the distinctive gifts that dads on average bring to the parenting enterprise really enter into the picture. And that you know, we need to attend to those, those gifts, we need to recognize the way in which dads really um, do play a central role in the formation of their children. Um, and that unfortunately because of the breakdown of marriage in, in Canada and the United States and many other developed countries, we're splitting apart you know, these two parents and we're forcing the state to pick one parent oftentimes is the primary caretaker and you know in many contexts it's going to be the mother um, and I think you know that's there's obviously a great tragedy there because those kids are, are losing day-to-day -day contact oftentimes with their father and their father you know as I've said you know today in a number of ways brings some distinctive gifts the other point to make is that um, and I mentioned that, you know, generally speaking, women are stronger in kind of the day-to-day -day nurturing and the dads are a bit more distant from the parenting enterprise. And this kind of view, which I think is held by many academics, has been advanced in some contexts to suggest that two moms would actually be even better than a mother and a father. But I think what that doesn't recognize is that kids also need to have a caregiver in the home, in the family, who isn't kind of always hovering in a sense over them and who kind of lets them go and, and you know, skin their knee or lets them you know, experience the, the, uh, the feeling of being thrown up in the air as a toddler and then being caught. You know? um, so that there's something about having that 
you know, that security that often comes from mom and then having that challenge, that, that push out of the nest that often comes from dad and that there's a, there's a kind of beauty and power to being exposed as a child to both of these two things. And yeah, we need to balance them. Um, and we need to make sure that in discussions of, of divorce and child custody, that we are a lot more intentional about making sure that dads are connected to their kids than oftentimes we, we do, at least from what I've seen in the US. So. Thank you. Your uh, study of uh, the family that prays together got a lot of attention here in Canada. And I was wondering if uh, you, were, you were relating the benefits to uh, the chance of divorce. I was wondering if you had studied the effect on teens or children as well. Okay, so I did a study in, um, in the fall of last year that looked at um, reports of marital happiness um, among African Americans, Latinos, and whites. And what we found there is we looked at the impact of attending church together, sharing the same religious values, and praying together as a couple. Um, and we defined praying as things outside of just saying grace at meals. So it was actually you know, kind of a deliberate effort for a husband and wife to pray together. And what we found in those three things was that they were all correlated to higher quality marriages but that the most powerful predictor of those three, attendance, beliefs, and prayer together, was prayer together. That was the thing that was most strongly associated with um, couples being happier um, in their marriages. Um, I've also found in, in a different body of work that uh, individuals um, in the US who attended several times a month or more were 35% less likely to divorce compared to their peers who did not attend regularly. And I was just looking at individuals. If you were to look at spouses who attend together, I think the effect would have been even larger than that. Now, in terms of the outcomes on kids, I haven't done that particular research, but I have a colleague, John Barkowski, who's in Texas, UT San Antonio, who has looked at that issue. And he does find that kids um, do better um, both by their parents' ratings and also by their teachers' ratings. Um, when their parents attend religious services together, whereas when they're not attending together, not the same benefit. So all this, I think, suggests uh, on the religion front, to answer your question, is that having some unity between mom and dad, if, and that's not always, of course, possible. We, we all know that either from family or friends or our own experience. But when you can have that unity of life, religiously speaking, between a mother and a father, that seems to have a positive impact on the marriage um, and the parent-child relationship. Thanks, Brad. It's very interesting and enjoyable to listen to. With your, your data that you've had, it sounds like you have a lot of international data going into that uh, research at this time as well. I, I, your, your thoughts on European, North American, progressive countries, quote unquote, versus countries that have had, at least in the mainstay, more of a traditional outlook on, on some of these issues that you're talking about. Yeah. How, how broad a difference are you seeing? What, what can you reflect in terms of, of uh, the differences in what some of those outcomes are positively negative in, in, in both uh, sets of countries? That's a great question. I, I actually hope to answer that question you know, with some more work in part with IMSC on the, on the <laughs> or hopefully doing a project next year on education. But on the, I can talk a bit about sort of the input side of things. And we know is that even though, for instance, the TFR, um, the fertility rate is close to replacement, in the United States, for instance, and in Sweden, as we heard earlier today, um, marriage itself as an institution in some ways is weaker in those societies, including the US, um, compared to many Southern European countries um, and many East Asian countries that have a comparatively low fertility rate. So what's happened in those countries is they still want to connect you know, marriage and parenthood. So they have a fairly sort of stringent approach to doing that. Um, and in part because of that, they're not having you know, kids inside of wedlock and boosting their overall fertility rate. So what we're seeing around the world, I think, unfortunately, in the much, the, much of the developed world, is that either fertility is going fairly well on the one hand, um, or marriage is going fairly well on the other hand. And what we're not seeing really in many countries in the developed world, be they in Asia um, or the Americas or Europe, is that any one country you know, in, in those different regions is successfully combining replacement fertility with strong marriages. So you know, either they're not having enough kids to sustain themselves over time, or they're not having kids in the kinds of contexts where they're going to be getting the attention and the affection that they 
need from both their mother and their father. So I think as we look at the, the outcomes um, for kids, um, we'll see how either being raised in kind of a low fertility regime or being raised in a regime where you're not as likely to be raised in a stable married household, how all those things affect, affect kids. But that's really more, uh, more to come. I guess I would just say one thing on terms of the outcomes. We do know from Sweden, um, there's a very good study done about, uh, about eight years ago um, that looked at the entire population of Swedish children. And they compared single parent families with two parent families. And of course, they actually didn't differentiate those who were cohabiting with those who were married, because they don't do that in Sweden oftentimes. They just sort of lump them all together. But nonetheless, they found that kids who were living in the single parent families were much more likely to have thoughts of suicide, to have difficulties with drugs and alcohol. And of course, this was striking because these sort of negative psychological findings were coming out in a, in a society, um, as we heard just a little while ago, where there really is no child poverty. So you couldn't, you couldn't blame these outcomes on the fact that there were poor single mothers um, you know, doing their work as, as moms. It was clearly related to the structure and the, I think the lack of dad in the household. So, yeah. Yes, sir. The, <clears throat> the California ruling you presented, uh, you, you quoted, in which uh, the judge basically says that gender is, uh, is of no consequence uh, in, in parental uh, rearing. Was it uh, uh, challenged in any formal way, appealed or challenged? Was your work or your type of uh, work uh, presented? And what was the outcome of it? It has been appealed, and the Ninth Circuit is now um, considering that appeal. It will probably go on. I mean, because the Ninth Circuit is the most progressive circuit in the United States, um, that circuit will probably, I think, uphold either the whole ruling or aspects of the ruling, um, and that will then, I think, go to the Supreme Court. But um, there are a number of scholars who are working to kind of try to, to improve the level of scholarly discourse on that question you just raised, um, and also to bring new evidence to bear um, on that, the Supreme Court decision, which will come probably at some point in 2012. So, yes. I have a quick question. Sure. It's great to see you. Um, I just want to ask with regards to the stats, I know it's not exactly part of your talk, but with regards to gender, um, what happens with two moms, two dads? So homosexual couples, um, are, do they follow the same pattern as the single parent because there's lacking the other, right. um, either feminine or masculine side? Well, that's, I think, the $100,000 question moving forward. And Ross Park, who is a psychologist at the University of California at Riverside, um, has done a, uh, a chapter for a book I'm doing on gender and parenthood that suggests that in many gay and lesbian households, they actually do have a kind of um, role specialization, if you will, that's also kind of gendered in the sense that one partner tends to be more masculine and one partner tends mm -hmm. to be more feminine, even though there's either two women or two men. And the question you know, is, how does that affect um, the kids? Uh, on the research more generally, and of course there was a lit review done for the Canadian case here a number of years ago by my colleague Stephen Nock at the University of Virginia. What I would say is that much of that literature, methodologically speaking, is quite limited. Where they're dealing with samples, actually most of the studies that have been done, about 40 peer-reviewed studies, are based upon samples of less than 110 kids. And you know, probably less than 50 or 40 kids from same-sex households. It's also the case, too, that many of the comparison groups are not with the intact bio-married family. So you're comparing, say, kids from a lesbian household to kids in a blended family or kids in a single parent family. And I'm not sure that tells you very much. Um, so we're looking now to do some larger random representative studies where you're taking kids from a variety of family contexts, including same-sex households, and you know, doing a much more rigorous study from a, sort of a methodological perspective to see you know, what that what that tells us. So I think, you know, the other point I would make here too is that it really took us about 25 years to figure out how the divorce revolution affected kids. And we, you know, we got this sort of really good results in the 1990s, bearing in mind, of course, the divorce revolution hit in the 70s. So I think we have to wait, you know, as a scientist, I would have to wait probably about you know, 15 more years to get a sense of how kids who are raised in same-sex households do not only a sort of you know, eight-year-olds in school, but also, of course, as people who are forming their own families and whatnot. So, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, based on the information you've given us, I assume that you would be in favor of governments uh, promoting and encouraging single-income families, where there's one income earner and, and uh, 
preferably the mother caring for the children. Uh, do you find any movement anywhere in the world trying to uh, convince governments to go in that direction? I don't find any movement, at least in the developed world, that I'm aware of on that front. Um, but I guess I, I want to be careful here, too, because I think what I've also discovered in my work is that, at least in the United States, the modal preference for women who are married with children, not this is what their preference is, not what the practice is, but the modal preference for about 45% of married moms, this is moms with kids ages you know, six months to 16 years, is to be working part time. And about 35% would like to be at home full time, and about, actually it's precisely 18% would like to work full time. So I'm not necessarily opposed to dual, dual earners. I think we have to just recognize though that in most families, the preference will be on the part of the, of the mother is to be at home full time or to have a kind of a foot in, in the workforce part time. Um, and that I think that kind of orientation would be probably you know, more politically palatable too. But also it does sort of recognize, at least in our current milieu, that there are a lot of women out there who would like to, who are moms, who'd like to work part time. And for one reason or another, they feel like they can't really manage that. So. Are there studies, or do you think there would be value in studying the role of others in raising uh, children? The, the, the moms and dads, they might be uncles, they might be an aunts, they might be grandparents. They might even be macro influencers in society, like athletes, uh, political leaders, teachers. Are there studies being done about their impact upon uh, families, or do you think there might be value in studying that? I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a good question, something we should be studying. Um, there has been some work looking at single mothers who are relying upon their own mothers, their grandmothers, to help rear the kids, and that actually, um, this is once again my mentor at Princeton, Sarah McLean, and that didn't work, work out so well. And I think probably it's a, it's a question of who's really the mom. Is it mom or grandma? And, and, and that can be problematic for some of these families. Um, but I think one thing we also don't know too is that how do kind of how does the intact nuclear family compare in its success raising kids um, compared to the intact extended family? Of course, there are many more immigrant families both in the U.S. and in Canada who have both mom and dad and grandma and grandpa or you know some other kin, aunts and uncles who are involved in the rearing of children, and that that can be more complicated for you know mom and dad, the parents at times for reasons that are obvious I think to anyone who has who has kin and, and whatnot, but from a kid's perspective, that might be the ideal. So I think it'd be interesting to look at maybe the, the best thing for a child, or from a child's perspective, is to have the active involvement, not just of mom and dad, but of you know, grandparents and uncles and aunts on a regular basis. So, but it's a good question. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thanks Dad. very much. Thank you. And actually, don't go away just yet. Okay. On behalf of oh, the, the IMFC and all of okay, us here. Great, thank, thank you, you very much, much. Dad. Thank you.